G'day everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name's Andrew Whitehouse um, and I'm the Chief Research Officer of the Autism CRC. Welcome to this uh, final webinar that the Autism CRC has been hosting uh, over Autism Awareness Month. Um, we've shared some of our latest research and outcomes from the three programs, the early years, school years and adulthood. Um, today's webinar is going to be focused on the school years. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that you are actually um, able to ask questions and you can do that by typing in the panel on the right hand side of your screen, that's the left, let's go that way, the right hand side of the screen, and we'll collate these um, and at the end we'll um, be able to uh, ask our uh, various speakers today uh, your questions. So please do check them in and we'll, we'll make sure we get to so, on to today's topic. So, in our school years program, we're researching the provision of autism appropriate educational environments and programs that optimise students' social, behavioural, and academic success. That's a mouthful. Basically, we're trying to uh, provide the best opportunities through the school years so kids can uh, be happy and healthy kids and grow into happy and healthy adults. At the same time, we're working to equip teachers to manage even the most complex behaviours. Our work is the first nationwide collaboration to undertake evidence-based quality research on appropriate education for students on the autism spectrum. We're producing protocols across all school systems uh, to support children succeed at school and well beyond school. So we're going to be joined today by um, two of Australia's foremost education researchers, Dr. Trevor Clark, Dr. Beth Saggers, and we're very, very privileged to have that opportunity. So without further ado, I'm going to get on to introducing Trevor. Now, our first presenter today is Trevor, um, and like uh, many of our speakers, Trevor wears many hats. Uh, so Trevor is, a, in, in no particular order, uh, an Autism CRC project leader. He's the National Director of Autism Spectral, Spectrum Australia, or ASPECTS Research Program, and Senior Consultant for their Education Program. He's also Adjunct Associate professor, professor at the Griffith Institute for Educational Research at Griffith Uni. Um, he doesn't appear to sleep much either. On all those titles. Uh, Trevor is a uh, special educator with comprehensive, comprehensive experience and knowledge of educational programs and service provision for students on the autism spectrum. As a result of 30 years' experience in the field of New Zealand, in, in the field in New Zealand, England, and Australia. So today, Trevor is going to speak to us about the transition model of practice for teachers of children on the spectrum. So here, Trevor. Great. Uh, many thanks, Andrew, for that introduction. I don't think that's the short version, but <laughs> um, anyway, it's very kind, very kind words. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to share um, this uh, ACRC, Program 2 Educational Research Project, uh, which is entitled Transition Models of Practice for Teachers. So I'm currently the project lead leader of the, the the, the whole of the project, however, Dr. Wen Wendy Beamish from Griffith University is um, leading what we call the early years team. And I'll explain that in a moment. So as, as I said, this is um, an education. So it's a program two ACA RC research project. The other years being the early years and adulthood. Um, just a little bit of background to the reason why we undertook this study just from the 2015 ABS um, data, it's estimated there are over 107,000 school age students, that's five to 19 years on the autism spectrum. So that's a lot of school age students in our schools right throughout Australia. 70%, the majority of them are actually educated and inclusive, educating set settings, in other words, mainstream education settings. And I guess the statistic that's quite alarming is the last one. Across the lifespan, educational outcomes are lower than those of students with and without other disabilities. So I guess in terms of the reason, the rationale for the study is really in the school years, we want to get better at how we teach, how we educate children on the spectrum according to their needs that may in the end improve post-school outcomes, which is really the aim of all education. It's about post-school as our young people become adults. So this is the aim of our research project, which is called the Models of Practice, to trial two models of practice. So these are a whole range of education strategies 
for children on the autism spectrum, which support teacher decision making in relation to effective education of students on the spectrum as they move through. So there were two year cohorts. The study was looking at prep to kindergarten and into year one, the early years. So the acronyms are EY or early years, models of practice, and then the middle years, the secondary schools, year seven into year eight. So there's two kind of cohorts of school age students. That's our research team. So the senior years, the middle years project, myself and the ASPECT research team, the early years, Wendy Beamish, Annalise Taylor, who's the PhD candidate, and the whole team, we've had collaboration support from Jill Ashburner, uh, Jessica Painter, Madonna Tucker, and Susan Walker. So quite um, a, an extensive team with a lot of experience in educating our students. So in terms of the outcomes and the impact, these are the major outcomes that we trust we'll be able to deliver. Staff capacity building in schools and within school clusters, support for teachers to better deliver the Australian curriculum for all students and to enhance teacher education um, programs. So they're fairly um, lofty outcomes, but we believe that this project is very unique and comprehensive and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But we really hope that the impact is to influence teacher um, personal growth and professional growth and quality of their teaching and which will have a flow on effect for children with and without ASD. I should mention that a lot of the models of practice or the autism education strategies really apply, not just for our cohort of children on the spectrum, but for all school age students, children. So the strategies equally apply to the rest of the children and the, and the child with autism's class. Okay, in terms of the project, I must also stress this is a project that was really about enhancing, you know, teacher knowledge and education about um, the best strategies, how to better support children and their classes on the spectrum. This is not a project that's examining student outcomes. I guess a lot of research, and Beth will talk about that in a moment, the educational needs analysis project. Really the feedback from that project and other research is that the thing that makes the best difference to the education of our students is teacher knowledge and understanding of autism spectrum disorder. So that primarily is the aim of this project. It's about increasing teacher knowledge and confidence to teach children on the spectrum. So as a result of a very long um, recruitment period um, following ethics approvals, I think we had 14 different education sectors we need to get eth eth ethics approval to undertake the research. Uh, these are the participating schools who came to the study. So three states, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. And just to add to it, we were exploring were there any differences between metro schools, regional schools and remote schools. So in total, we had 33 schools that joined the study, which was fantastic. 23 in the early years, 10 in the senior secondary school years. As I said, 60 teachers and the 14 ethics applications. Just for your interest again, I guess the methodology of research design, is, I think is very applicable to school settings. As we know, schools and for the teachers who joined us today on the webinar, schools are very dynamic places. And I think, you know, when you're undertaking a study, this is a type of action research, even though it's referred to as design-based research. What that means is you can actually trial or implement a treatment program. In this case, it was the models of practice, which involves a whole lot of practice briefs about teaching strategies for our um, children. And um, what it allows you to implement and undertaking the data collection, and as you can see, the surveys, interviews, et cetera. And then we come back and we're in the phase right now of doing the data analysis and what we do is go back and from the feedback from teachers and schools, we will refine and change, revise the models of practice, all those teaching strategies. So it's quite a dynamic research design, but one it's one that goes through a number of cycles and I think is really well suited to schools. Um, development of each model of the practice for early years and middle years. At the very outset, it was important that we selected 
teaching strategies from the literature where there was research evidence. So that was the determination, step one. Step two, we did what was called in research world a content validation. So those strategies we selected, the research team went out to experts in the field of autism and education for their comment. They were refined, step three. Then we did a national wide survey, what we call social validation. So each of those models of practice, the strategies, went to teachers around Australia for their feedback, their comment. Which are the most user friendly? Which do they think are the most applicable? And again, Beth will talk about, you know, what her project and what really are the um, educational needs of children on the spectrum as a result of her study. And then number four is consolidation of the practices. So we're about to go into that phase following um, the data analysis. Um, the models of practice. So just an example earlier is how did we select the practices? So these are related to the early childhood education framework, belonging, being and becoming. So I'll let you read that for yourself. So in total, the practices came under those three framework headings in early childhood, 29 for the early years. And there's some examples on the screen. I'll just read you one, perhaps the, the final one, becoming practices. Teacher monitors student learning using a variety of materials and strategies and uses this information to adjust their teaching to better meet student needs. Okay, so that's just one example. In terms of the middle years of the secondary school strategies, we look to the US and their education, special education framework um, that includes, really has been designed to increase uh, positive educational outcomes for disadvantaged and minority students in uh, US um, schools, et cetera. So rigor, relevance and relationships. So those are the frameworks, the three headings that we looked for the education strategies, the 30, 36 of them. Just some examples there. I'll let you quickly look at those yourself under rigor, relevance, practices. Okay. Right. Um, there's um, uh, an example. So the, each of them are actually written down as a practice brief. In other words, these are the actual specific teaching strategies. So each one, uh, and so all the schools who received the models of practice, they were given access to the current autism website where they could learn and uh, receive the information about every one of those practices. So that's an example under self-regulation. So we have the practice as articulated, how does it help, what is it, how does it work, et cetera, et cetera, and then links to other resources for teachers to further explain and help them understand and implement each of those practice groups. So again, as I said, that was the website um, that all the schools and the study were able to access. Just to let you know that, as I said, the study was really about professional learning, professional development for teachers. So the study is also trying to elicit what is the best type, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, the best type of training or professional development. So we actually explored three different types. One was face-to-face -face coaching. So we train coaches in the models of practice and all the practice briefs to actually go out to meet with teachers and schools to do face-to-face -face coaching. So the two two-hour sessions. The second condition we were exploring and schools were allocated randomly to each of these three condition. conditions was online coaching. So same the number of hours, but it was all online, not face-to-face. -face. And condition three it was just the information. So there was no coaching that teachers and schools could go onto the website to access the models of practice. And then of course, we did surveys, interviews for each of those conditions. Just share very quickly, this is only the very first look at some of the data, our research assistants are beginning that process now. So in terms of the early years, the knowledge, as you can see from that graph, so term three prior to them accessing the information on the website, that's how they felt, that was their level of knowledge. So as you can see, it was in the blue. It was fairly low. There's only a few that scored 
themselves as having relatively high knowledge in the high section, uh, none in the very high and following the study and the access in a period of a term, they were able to implement the practice briefs, models of practice, there was a big increase in their confidence. In fact, 17, almost 18% scored in a very high range. Level of confidence, again, you see a similar trend, a big increase in teacher confidence. There's just a quote, I've benefited the children, it's benefited the children, benefited me, it's a great resource that's here, self-explanatory, easy to read. That was from a Victorian prep teacher. Just the initial data from the middle years, again, a really good increase in the teacher's knowledge as a result of the study. Great increase in confidence again, up to the very good range, the 25% scoring very good, how they felt they were in terms of their confidence and implementing their strategies. And again, one of the secondary, and we had an autism instructional leaders, so we trained one person, an AIL, or to instructional lead in the secondary school. So again, there's feedback. I'll let you read that yourselves. Um, and just this was a comprehensive study. You imagine uh, undertaking a study in three different states, multiple education sectors. So we had government, non-government, Catholic sectors involved. So there were, this was a project that we had to be very nimble and we were faced with quite a lot of challenges, but we also, you know, worked to put in place solutions, which we believe, you know, were very successful and resulted in, you know, the study being, you know, carried out. So I won't go any further into those. So, and again, a very exciting study. And I am, you know, I guess I work for Aspect and I'm not just promoting our education conference, which is August. 29th, 31st in Brisbane this year, but many of the education CRC projects, studies that are coming to conclusion will be presented at this conference. So I trust that you know, as many can attend the conference, please join us. Great. Thanks very much, Trevor. That was um, a really interesting presentation. And can I just uh, remind people to please, if they have any questions, just chuck them in the um, the chat box down there on the right hand side, and and we'll get to them uh, at the end. Um, thanks very much, Trevor. Now we'll um, what we'll do is we'll move on to um, our next speaker, which is um, or who is Dr. Beth Saggers. Um, uh, Beth is an autism CRC project leader and a senior lecturer at the Queensland University uh, of Technology with almost 30 years of teaching experience working with uh, students on the autism spectrum across all phases of schooling and across a diverse range of educational settings. Today, Beth is going to be speaking to, speaking to us about the early years behaviour support for children on the autism spectrum. Over to you, Beth. Okay, thanks everyone. So um, this is reporting on some initial findings from a project that we're doing through the CRC that looks at uh, behaviour support, but I'm going to start with some background information and some of that uh, Trevor has already discussed, but I'll just talk to it a little bit. So we know that 70% of children with a diagnosis on the autism spectrum are now enrolled in mainstream schools and that is across the world, but that's not to say that they're not needing additional support and adjustments to be made within those settings. So I think that's an important point to highlight with that. We also know that um, despite an increasing prevalence in research in the field of autism, if you look at, for example, the Bureau of Statistics information from 2012 and compare it with 2015, there is still a significant amount of uh, educational restrictions uh, experienced by this particular group of students in school settings. So to give you a little bit of background for this particular project, the um, educational needs analysis, which was an initial uh, project that we did, which was trying to do a snapshot in time, looking at the needs of students on the spectrum in the school years from a range of different uh, perspectives, including parents, educators, specialists, and students as 
cells. And the thing that really uh, came to the forefront with those results was the significance of the social and emotional and behavioural needs as uh, all of the stakeholders were saying required the highest level of support within school settings and was much higher, uh, for example, than uh, academic needs in a lot of situations. So we know from that particular research that th that had the biggest impact in schools and was requiring the most uh, support. Behavioural support is seen as quite essential to help uh, with self-regulation with uh, this particular group of students and was also at the same time one of the most common supports put in place in schools. Interestingly, though, uh, educators don't necessarily feel particularly confident in their ability to be able to find, evaluate and apply evidence-based practices to support students on the spectrum. Uh, and this came out quite strongly in the needs analysis as well. So uh, one of our biggest challenges from an inclusion point of view is to help uh, school communities, including the students uh, themselves, to be able to manage some of those high impact social, emotional and behavioural needs that influence learning within educational contexts. And we also need to be providing support to teachers to help them meet some of the very unique and challenging complex support needs of some of the students that they may be experiencing who have a diagnosis on the spectrum. So from a professional development point of view, one of the things that we do know and is constantly highlighted is the need for teachers to have more uh, autism specific knowledge to help reduce some of the impact of complex needs within educational settings. One of the difficulties with that is that what's often missed with that piece of information is the importance of helping teachers to translate that professional knowledge into practice in the contextual settings that they're in. So a lot of the um, strategies that you can use to help support kids on the spectrum are going to have uh, a different effect or uh, different influence based on the context, based on the group of students you're working with, based on the environmental factors that might be influencing how you put those practices into place. One of the added difficulties we know for teachers in rural and remote areas is the ability to be able to access uh, professional development and support um, because of the time and cost to access those things from more remote areas. We also know that professional development, the way that it works best or the best translation of professional development is to help that be into the natural class environment. And that helps to not only make it part of core teacher practices, but also helps teachers to be able to work out how to embed that with other things that they need to do in their daily practice. So from a, a technology for service delivery point of view, technology as a way to assist um, or augment face-to-face -face service delivery, particularly for rural and remote areas, has been used uh, in increasing prevalence in the health field, for example, to support uh, diagnosis, clinical interventions. But it has not been used very um, much within the education space. And what we wanted to try and do was to look at how to provide more remote-based support and service delivery to rural and remote areas. But we also wanted to look at how does this inform uh, our support of educational communities. So from the needs analysis, we know a number of things about perceptions of remote support. One, there was uh, an identification that it has a lot of benefits for stakeholders. So it allows um, increased collaboration amongst different stakeholders involved in support and delivery of um, support to students on the spectrum, that it can reduce time and cost, can provide that sort of additional PD. 
but we also know that it has a lot of limitations. So there is still uh, that preference for face-to-face -face services. It's often difficult to coordinate schedules um, and depending on how effective your technology is, how uh, accessible it can be. So that sort of is the background to this particular project, which um, is looking at uh, providing this sort of tele-classroom consultation approach in more rural and remote areas um, with an aim to looking at well, what are some of the guidelines uh, and approaches for using this sort of uh, technique to support uh, professional development for teachers and that translation of knowledge on the ground for teachers and how can that actually be used to help empower um, the people on the ground working with, with students on the spectrum um, and, and allow them to uh, improve their confidence with this sort of approach. So um, we have looked at a number of schools across Queensland and New South Wales. We were focused on uh, students in the early years. We are still uh, collecting data in some schools. And we did particularly want to focus on um, children who had been identified as needing more targeted, intensive, individualised type intervention and support that the school was sort of flagging, it was beyond their internal capacity to support the needs of the students involved. So I guess uh, some of the key things that are important when you're considering this type of approach is that we were focused on a collaborative problem solving consultative approach. It is something that uh, constantly evolves as a result of our um, consultation and collaboration with the partners on the ground. Um, it has been used quite a lot in the medical profession, as we've said, and the health professions for assessment and service delivery, but um, it doesn't tend to be used a lot in education. Um, um, and what we wanted to do was to combine face-to-face um, -face and online support uh, and provide something that helped teachers to translate uh, information they had, professional knowledge and information, to the contextual fit of the school, the classroom and the particular individual students' needs. So obviously we were looking at trying to improve teacher confidence, skills and knowledge but also to help teachers in rural and remote areas to feel valued and supported for what they were doing. And as a result, also uh, increase uh, successful outcomes for the students involved. So we sort of have this, this uh, little bit of a, um, these different phases that we use as part of the project. So there's a recruitment phase, obviously, where we're trying to uh, get schools involved and have schools identify that um, they wanted to be part of the project. We also at the same time, because we're working in collaboration with uh, Autism Queensland and Aspect New South Wales in those different states, looking at a team of people to help provide professional development and support to those particular schools. Um, then that team would be involved on the ground at the school level in usually to start with with phone contact, email contact, uh, trying to set up a face-to-face -face, uh, time to go out and have a look at um, the particular context, collect some information around the needs of the school, the student, the family involved, and do some uh, initial assessments to look at, well, where are the needs? And as a result of that, to develop a plan. And then in conjunction with the school to implement that plan. Um, and during that time to have a combination of some face-to-face -face visits, but also more of an online delivery of support and services across that time to help them to fine tune, tweak those approaches, look at how effective they are, and then to finish up with uh, a post-intervention sort of follow-up and transition visit. 
So uh, just to highlight some of our initial findings in this project and how they might apply across the board to schools. What we found is that the approach has had a, a very positive effect in the schools that have been involved. And it has in, highlighted some key enablers and barriers to using this type of approach and um, is providing us with good learning outcomes that we hope eventually will develop, be used to develop some more evidence-based practice guidelines for using this type of approach to support uh, school communities. So one example is a little uh, person that we were working with in a Queensland school. And this just identifies some of the triggers that were involved uh, for this particular student in uh, setting up some of the challenges that were being faced at a school environment. Um, and there was a number of different potential triggers that were involved. Uh, lots of things around making mistakes, missing out, um, having to share, his mum coming um, to school unannounced, handwriting tasks, there was a, a range of different things. Okay, so sorry. And um, so uh, in working with the school through the phases that we uh, discussed in the previous uh, couple of slides, there was an amazing change in this child's behaviour uh, as a result of being involved in the project. So the school was a P to 10 school. It was um, a small rural school uh, that ranged from P to 10. And a lot of the issues that were experienced, which is uh, quite a common occurrence, is, uh, were in the playground. So uh, as a result of the work that was done within the project, there was a big change around in the incidents that were occurring in school. So for example, there were 10 to 12 incidents in term one to no incidents in term four. So the changes started to um, occur in term two, and then it's quite significant changes were seen at school level in term three. The thing that comes out a lot with this approach is how critical that combination of online and face-to-face -face is, that it's not enough to provide online delivery of things, that there does need to be that face-to-face, -face, and particularly that initial face-to-face -face visit to know um, who it is that you are dealing with um, sort of more personally. And uh, there was also uh, felt like a more proactive communication between home and school as a result of what was put in place within this project. So that was sort of the parents' perception. From the teachers' perception, um, they felt that this sort of approach was much better to some of the more fly-in, fly-out approaches that they had experienced in the past. They definitely also agreed that the face-to-face -face meetings were essential. They felt that this, this type of approach helped them to learn about um, the students on the spectrum and how to translate that knowledge into practice in their classrooms and gave them more confidence to do that. And for this particular teacher as well, they identified that it helped them to develop more of a leadership role around that type of support across the whole school community. The, the thing that really came out within this particular case study was how this approach helped to support uh, an improved partnership between the school and the parent, and that it became a far more proactive uh, partnership that looked at the positives rather than uh, prior to the um, this approach being used, it was more of a reactive approach that had developed over a period of time. And this uh, approach was able to sort of turn that round into something more positive. Uh, from the point of view of, we were also trying to look at, well, how often do people need to have uh, a meeting or touch base? And what we're finding is that this is very trial and error. It is quite idiosyncratic to the needs of the school and the staff involved. And that also there are some periods of time when they need more support, when they're starting to develop strategies. 
at other times you can phase back that sort of support and have more of an online approach and even reduce to things like email contact or phone, phone calls. The main benefit from the teacher point of view is that everyone was, um, as a result, of what were the aims for that particular student, what approaches were being put into place, and practical positive solutions could be developed in collaboration with the, um, the team that was going out to support them. Um, from the principal's point of view, internet and technology, as uh, I think we all experience from time to time, there were some initial barriers as a result of that, but they also highlighted how it built the teacher's capacity not only to um, support students on the spectrum, but also to use technology. And in this case, this student was only uh, a recently new graduate who was quite technology savvy in her own personal life, but to use technology to support her teaching, which was um, something that we actually looked at as a way of providing supports for this particular student was quite new to her and she wasn't very confident with that. Um, the approach also helped the staff across the whole school setting to implement supports that were um, preventative, proactive, that also helped to reduce some of the outcomes that they had previously had uh, in the playground and definitely improved partnerships. So these are just some of the quotes from the different participants that we interviewed. Uh, and I won't read through all of those, uh, but uh, just letting you know those are there if you want to go back and listen to the webinar. So from a specialist point of view, they also, who the people who were going out support the schools, there was definitely more of a shared goal experience by the end between both the school and the family involved. Uh, so the parent was really extremely positive. Uh, the biggest benefit would be teacher confidence from the, the team's point of view. Um, and the teacher themselves backed that up. So what we are finding with this sort of approach is that it does create help to create inclusive cultures within schools and we are mapping a lot of the results against the uh, index for inclusion and finding that uh, from the, the index point of view it's creating inclusive cultures producing inclusive policies and helping to evolve inclusive practices that meet the specific and very idiosyncratic needs of individual schools and students that we're involved with. And these are just some examples, which I won't go through um, at the moment, but you can have a look at. So things like greater collaboration and improved uh, communication, shared values. Helping to organise and put in place support being able to orchestrate the learning and mobilise the resources that are on the ground in the schools was uh, evident from the approach. So what we have learned so far is that this approach can help to uh, reduce restrictive practices and increase the use of more uh, appropriate inclusive practices. It does help the teachers on the ground sorry, um, and build their confidence. And it does, particularly for rural and remote areas, help reduce those feelings of isolation for not just the schools, but the families involved. Um, I think one of the things that it really highlights for me and from my own experience in schools is the importance of in-situ support. It's not just enough to give people professional knowledge. It's the support required to translate and put that into practice in situ that is essential. And uh, people need help and support a lot of the time to do that, particularly in cases where things uh, they're experiencing are far more challenging or complex, 
or requiring a lot of collaboration with external stakeholders. Uh, the simpler you can keep things, the better. But uh, it is important to consider how to contextualise the strategies and support that you're asking people to put in place. Um, that it is a, around this problem solving approach that is in collaboration with the stakeholders on the ground that is most important. And it's a how support has to evolve. As things improve, what you do on the ground has to be adjusted uh, to suit that progress. And uh, people often need that sounding board uh, and other people to bounce their ideas off. Um, and this is just uh, some uh, very recent feedback that we've had to talk about more recent prog progress since the um, project had finished in that school. And this particular student was spending uh, 90 to 95 percent of their time outside a classroom to actually joining in a couple of weeks ago and situating himself at morning tea and lunchtime with the other kids and actually initiating um, a game with them. So thanks everyone. Fabulous. Thank you, Beth. And um, if I could possibly ask um, Trevor to pop himself back on the screen as well, because we have a little bit of time for questions, which is fabulous. So um, uh, um, just um, while, while Trevor comes back on, Beth um, has assured me that she's not actually presenting from a sauna. Um, but but um, at times, um, uh, we do get a bit of echo going back and forth. Um, so, uh, guys, if we're not speaking, can we just put it on mute, if that's okay? That'd be terrific. And um, inevitably, you'll start speaking in your, on mute. And if you do that, I'll just leave it. Okay. Um, we just say um, a question um, straight away for Trevor, if, if that's okay. So, Trevor, a couple of questions. We'll go with the, the nice and easy one first. The practice brief sound great. Um, yes. Is it possible to download these briefs from anywhere? Um, in time, we hope. I can't fully answer that yet. Basically, as I said, we're doing, in terms of the, the study, we're in the data analysis phase. And remember, I talked about the design-based methodology. Well, over the next few months, once we've finished the data analysis, we have to then go back so what schools and teachers are telling us, we need to go back and refine all the practice briefs that are currently sitting on the Autism Connect um, website. Currently, they've only been available to the participating teachers and schools. However, we are talking, there's another project that's been going on as one of the ACRC projects, which is the Knowledge um, Translation Project. So, uh, I'm not sure if people are aware, but really the whole aim for doing this very large program of research on autism in Australia is really about, you know, that each of the studies, each of the projects has a value and has positive outcomes for people and children on the spectrum. So that also includes teachers. So um, the ACRC is working towards what they call utilisation projects that actually make all the information resources available from many of these studies available to people on spectrum, their carers, teachers, whatever. So um, I trust that, um, you know, we will be working with the other projects in the ACRC to make that happen. If that does, it wouldn't be available to the very early start, I would imagine not until 2019. But please watch the space, stay in touch, perhaps with Andrew as the key person who might be able to give an update as some of our utilisation projects proceed. Sorry, Andrew. Thanks. No, not at all. Thank you, Trevor. No, I'm very, uh, very interested in this. And, and just as, as a general principle, the, the, the Autism CRC is, um, uh, uh, you know, about many things. And two of the main things is, is generating new knowledge um, and making sure that that's then translated on the ground and then taking existing knowledge and making sure that's translated on the ground. So it's not just the generation of knowledge, it's actually getting it into practice. And so that is a key focus. And so please do watch this space um, for these to be publicly available. 
Um, this yeah. question is to both of you. Um, maybe given, given Trevor, uh, Trevor's just um, uh, ha, uh, been speaking, I'll go to you first, Trevor, and then I'll, I'll go to Bev. Um, yeah. So often a barrier um, to work, uh, Barry, is working with teachers to improve their teaching quality. And one of the barriers is their attitudes that they have towards feedback. Um, success is only seen when teachers are willing and able to be open to change. How do you feel might be the most effective way to get teachers to buy in to making changes that will help their students if their attitude is initially resistant? Tough question, um, and I'm glad you're answering it. <laughs> yes, yeah. I guess, you know, it is kind of, to answer that question, it really is linked into this project. So when I said in terms of our data analysis, we had surveys and interviews that teachers and the autism instructional leaders needed to participate in. So part of those questionnaires, we actually looked at teacher attitudes, teacher perceptions. So we will, when the results are finished, we will have some results about, and we're hoping there has been a change in teacher perception and attitude as a result of, you know, the introduction of the models of practice and those teaching briefs. So, and it's a very important question because you know, having spent, you know, I'm a teacher myself in my past many years in education and, you know, educating children on the spectrum, you know, you're absolutely right. Unless a teacher is engaged and really has the best interests of their students, and particularly children on the spectrum, you know, it, it's hard to get that change. However, you know, we trust that, you know, the impact of this study also changes educational sector policy, both federally and, and across the states, so that we trust that some of those policies will drive, you know, the delivery of programs in schools. Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks, uh, Trevor. And Beth, I'm gonna ask the same question. Um, do you have any tips um, about how to help um, uh, get buy-in from teachers um, if their attitude towards change might be initially resistant? One of the things that always stands out for me is the importance of building a relationship. And for some teachers, you can get that buy-in really quickly. But for other teachers, it takes um, time. And um, it's important to be establishing a positive relationship with that person to build a, a, a sense of trust in that relationship and a, sort of a collaborative uh, working relationship. Um, and also to be able to identify some sort of joint um, goals to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Like there are a number of times um, in a supporting role in classrooms, I've work, walked in and thought, Oh my goodness, there's so many things we probably need to change within this classroom to meet the needs of this particular student, one student in the class. But uh, I've always been very conscious of um, how that works for that teacher, how that works for their personality, how we might need to start with one thing, work on that. Um, and you've got to have some credibility with them as well. Um, and that often can take some time to develop so there's not a, a quick fix always but it is about the relationships that you build i think that are important it is yeah thanks beth that, that's um yeah great advice just like pretty much like everything in life i think um uh, the um the, the thing that strikes me i'm not an educationalist by background um at all the, the thing that strikes me about um the school setting is how complex the milieu is uh, you not only have hundreds of teachers, uh, you have hundreds of, uh, sorry, hundreds of uh, students, you have hundreds of families attached to those students. Um, you have uh, teachers of, uh, you know, in, in staff of varying abilities and varying experiences, um, and then varying leadership um, that all is all different between different schools. Um, amongst that complex milieu, I mean, can you identify the most significant barriers um, and how they might be alleviated. And, and the same answer as before is perfectly acceptable. This is a question from me, because I'm very interested as to how within such a complex ecosystem, systemic change can occur. So I might ask Trevor first. 
Yeah, I, I think, Andrew, really, it's, you know, it's about teacher understanding and knowledge and their confidence. So they are kind of two things in self-efficacy that, you know, the transition project was exploring and seeing if we could make some change around that. And I guess, you know, after being in the field of education autism for many, many years, you know, being a teacher of children on the spectrum, you know, running schools, working so closely with families. You know, my experience has been where a child fails with autism in, a, in any school setting, and I'm talking about special education settings as well. It's generally about very poor knowledge and understanding of autism spectrum disorder, number one. But number two, which is slightly more complicated, you know, how do you provide the best or the most appropriate education for children on spectrum in your class? And you've hit on it, Andrew, classes are really complex uh, kind of micro environments for teachers to manage. They have many, many competing demands on them. And then if they have several children on the autism spectrum, you know, some would throw up their hands in horror. When they do that, you know, my experience has been in, in many families that our children fail and it actually leads to school exclusion or very part-time you know enrollment in schools and classes and I guess you know the education program leaders you know in the ACRC really think we need to turn that around it's not acceptable that that situation can happen so easily you know it can be the result of just that lack of knowledge confidence teacher knowing what to do and you know, I'm not beating up on teachers because it is very complex. So I think the more we can deliver, you know, support, training to make teachers feel that they can cope and they want to be able to do the best thing by the children with any disability in their class, I think, you know, the, the better that will be and the more children on the spectrum will stay, you know, fully included in classes and you know, not to face, you know, the exclusion that really is quite common and it's unfortunate, I have to say that, but that is the reality we're facing. So, you know, I do believe that, you know, combined all the education CRC projects will definitely make a difference. It'll take some time. And of course, the other complexity, sorry, Beth, I am scrabbing too much time, but complexity is about how do you get research outcomes embedded in practice in a classroom. That's no easy mean feat. And I guess, you know, that's something that the Education 2, you know, leaders are looking at. And as I mentioned, the utilisation projects, which is a way of how can we better get the outcomes into classrooms. And I'm, sometimes in terms of the research world, it can take a 20 year lag between the study, the research outcomes, to embedding in practice. That's not good enough. We haven't got that time. So our aim is to get them utilised in place, teachers trained in a much quicker time period. Thanks, Trevor. But Beth, do you have much to add to that? Uh, I think on the ground, it's about um, keeping things simple, working on uh, something that's achievable and manageable, maybe something that when you're working with teachers, uh, it can be, uh, it's how you can see how something they're currently doing could be adjusted or modified. So that it's you're not, uh, to start with, maybe looking for add-ons or extras um, to help uh, and, and to work with people to look at identifying what's a priority, what I agree. Yeah. Um, that's simple and easy to start with, and then yes. you know over time build on on, on the skill set and and the relationship as a way of moving forward with some of the other more complex um, that are involved, and also making sure you you have that try and pull together that shared goal um, moving forward so that everybody is on the same page because otherwise you getting different messages. Yeah. Thank you, Beth, and, and thank you, Trevor. Um, look, I think we're going to wrap it up there now. We're, we're close to time because I just have a couple of thank yous to make. The first one, of course, is to 
um, Beth and Trevor for sharing um, their uh, years, <coughs> decades um, of uh, wisdom uh, in this area. We really do appreciate that. Um, I also really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Um, it's terrific that we had so many um, uh, uh, that could attend. And um, uh, the recording of today's webinar will actually be available on the Autism CRC YouTube channel, as well as the website in coming days, if you'd like to show it to uh, any of your uh, colleagues or friends. Um, I'd also um, uh, like to just thank Kelly Jackson, who has been uh, the coordinator of the webinars across the uh, across April. Uh, this is uh, this doesn't just organise itself and she's been marvellous um, in providing so much support to all of us. So we really do thank Kelly Jackson for uh, all of her help. Um, if you'd like to know more about Autism CRC's work across the lifespan, um, please visit our website where you can sign up for our e-news, which is quite good reading. Um, and if you'd like, you can participate in some of our studies as well. You can also follow us on social media. Um, the good news is that due to the feedback and interest we've received over the course of um, the April webinar series, we're planning on holding more regular webinars throughout the year. Um, so we'll see each other again. Um, keep uh, your eye on our website as well as the social media channels to, to find out more. and We'll make sure we uh, let as many people know as possible about that when that occurs. So again, thank you again for attending. We know an hour is a long time in anybody's schedule and we do appreciate it. We hope you got something out of it. Um, have a great rest of your afternoon and go well. Um, see you later, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Beth.